Tonight's topic is a little bit of a change of pace for us from our last few months, but it's very relevant, um, especially given the fact that we just celebrated the Feast of the Holy Family. The issue of so-called gay marriage, which I prefer to call it, for what it really is, unnatural unions, has been front and center for several years now. We hear it promoted, sometimes forcefully, in the media, the classroom, um, and even in our businesses, unfortunately. Acceptance of this false so-called human right is a denial of reality, and it's a denial of nature itself. And to promote it, to make it law, or to merely accept it, is to affirm a lie. And to make it a law is to force others, in somewhat degree, small or large, uh, to embrace that lie as well. So to speak to us tonight, a little bit more on the subject matter, is someone I hold much gratitude to God for. I had the great privilege to study under Dr. Dennis Marshall several years ago when I was at Aquinas. And uh, I did very much appreciate him then. And I must say, the older I get, the balder I get, <laughs> hopefully wiser, I do appreciate him more. And I truly mean that. So um, he's very much a light in our diocese and he's certainly a light at Aquinas College. So we're in for a treat tonight. A little bit about Dr. Marshall. He did his undergraduate studies at um, Hmm, Wheeling Jesuit College, and then you got your uh, master's degree and doctorate from Duquesne. He's been a professor of theology at Aquinas since 1998, and in the past few years has joined the faculty of the Catholic Studies Department as well. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Dennis Marshall. calls me back in October and he asked me if I would do a talk on um, this issue of homosexuality in society. And in looking over the other uh, talks that are giving during that time, I'm seeing talks on spirituality, poetry, and so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden the title of my talk comes out, A Natural Unions and the Collapse of Society. <laughs> during Christmas? <laughs> really? <laughs> But everybody needs a little bit of apocalypse to um, brighten up their Christmas season. Don't they? <laughs> Thankfully, right, since we've been living in a world that's been collapsing since Adam and Eve, the light that shines in the darkness this Christmas is not overcome by that darkness. And this is just as much as true with uh, the issue of homosexuality and the collapse of society, which I'm going to be speaking about for the next hour or so. One of the beautiful things I like about standing up here and speaking with you this evening is that Mark ensures me there's no Q&A period. So I can say anything that I want, there's the exit, and I'm gone. <laughs> I don't have to defend myself, I don't have to uh, mix it up with anybody if I don't like I kind of like that. But um, I'm sure that after the talk, if anybody has any questions, uh, as they buy me coffee or beer, I will be happy to answer whatever questions that you may have. Over the course of the past two years, I've given several talks on the HHS mandate. I've given several talks on um, the nature of homosexuality, the uh, birth control issue, uh, the meaning and the nature of love. All of these things seem to me to, um, to be connected to one another. And so I've been, I've been thinking about these things for quite some time. And Mark assured me that I didn't have to have a formal paper to present to you tonight, which is good. So I just scribbled notes in which I am going to um, uh, touch on certain points that I think are absolutely essential for us to understand in, um, in dealing with the topic of unnatural unions, so-called same-sex marriage, and the collapse of society. The first thing that I want to do is that I want to treat the collapse of society first. Because homosexuality or unnatural unions, whatever you want to call them, are not the cause of the collapse, but rather a symptom of the collapse. And if I were to stand here and give you my opinion about the collapse of our society, we might say Western culture in general, I think that it's beyond recovery because I'm rather grumpy about it at the moment. Uh, I'm, I'm not optimistic about Western civilization, although as a Christian I am hopeful all of us are obligated to wait in joyful hope 
for the coming of our Savior in the future, and I'm very hopeful about that, but I'm not optimistic about the state of Western civilization today, and there's a reason for that. The roots of the collapse that we are experiencing now extend back 600 years at least to the Renaissance, if not before, if we wanted to take it all the way back to Adam and Eve, we could do that too. So I want to start with the collapse, because that collapse is going to give us insight into the nature of the disorder of soul, the spiritual disorder, the pneumopathology that we experience in the West, and it would also give us insight into why it is that the culture in which we live promotes things as good that are evil. Because we're disordered in our soul. And we're disordered in our soul because we've lost the foundation of uh, a, a, proper or, a properly ordered soul towards the divine ground or God. So let me begin there and deal with the collapse. And I want to recommend to you highly the author Eric Vogelin. How many of you have ever heard of Eric Vogelin? Okay, good. He wrote an essay back in 1960 called um, Reason, the Classic Experience. And in that profound and very um, dense article, the substance of that, uh, his idea, can be summarized in this way. That reason is only reason to the degree that it is oriented to the divine ground. That human beings, because they are rational animals, find their proper fulfillment when reason is oriented to knowing the source of things and then knowing everything else in relation to that source. This is called wisdom, right? This is what the classical Greeks called wisdom. Because to live in um, relationship, in proper orientation to the divine ground, one's intellect was not only properly ordered, but one's will was properly ordered as well. The man of excellence, the man of virtue, the Socrates and the Aristotle become the model man of, one, of, of those who are properly oriented uh, according to their nature to being and knowing and, to, and living well. Does this make sense? Now, according to Aristotle and Plato, not everybody is capable of this kind of excellence. This excellence is something that is only accessible to a few people who have the leisure to pursue that excellence and ultimately to be trained, if you will, to become what Aristotle and Plato saw as the philosopher type of king. Most people do not live in proper orientation to the divine ground because they are ignorant. This is one of the sources of disorder in the soul. Ignorance which could be overcome through education. Those of you who have heard this idea before in which um, uh, if we have problems in our world, the thing that's going to solve those problems is education. That has its roots in Greek classical thought. But the fact of the matter is, is not everybody is capable of the training that would require or that would make it possible for one to achieve the fulfillment of his or her capacities as a rational being. Most people, according to Aristotle and Plato, lived with their reason ordered towards something else. Fame, or money, or sensual pleasure. These people were themselves disordered who needed to be rightly ordered in, a, in the political sphere through just laws and the just ruling of the philosopher king. So where the philosopher king in himself lived in such a manner as to live rightly in wisdom towards the divine ground, because, because people in the polity were incapable of that, it was the wise philosopher king who structured society in such a way that people, according to their, uh, according to their capacities and according to their merits, were governed in such, in such a way as to fashion a community that would lead to the common good. The best good for the society under the rulership of someone who knew, under the rulership of someone who was excellent. Now, out of this experience, Vogelin points out, that when you have this idea burst onto the scene, 
the discovery of reason, if you will, in, in the Greek sphere, the struggle to achieve order, not only in the soul, the individual soul, but in society, is, um, is a dangerous enterprise because the tensions of order, the, the drive to know, the drive to be um, attuned appropriately to the divine ground and to be attuned appropriately to everything within the world in which we live, that is something that is achieved through hard work and is maintained um, in a tenuous fashion because uh, the temptations that we suffer, that we experience in the face of this um, mean that we achieve a fragile victory, a fragile and tenuous hold on wisdom, on knowledge, and so on. But nevertheless, despite this, in this analysis, Vogelin points out that when you read Plato, when you read Aristotle, what they articulate for us that man is a rational animal, that we human beings by nature desire to know, and we not only desire to know that which is immediately before us, but that which is the source of those things that we, um, uh, that we seek, this becomes a, a, a a part of the treasury, the common treasury of human wisdom, a legacy that is bestowed upon them by us, that we receive even down to the present day. To be a human being, to be a rational being, to be an intelligent man, to be an intelligent woman, is to live in a proper order with respect to our knowledge of the source of the world and the things within the world. When we live in that attunement, then we can judge the things of this world appropriately and properly and utilize them in a fashion that helps us to not only maintain our human dignity, but also to achieve its perfection. Does this make sense? Okay, good. Now, this inheritance from the Greek world is something that Christianity brings into itself, especially in the synthesis of the Middle Ages. The difference being this, is that when Christ enters into the darkness of our existence, there is this fundamental realization, a fundamental realization that was only implicit in Aristotle and Plato, and that is this, that we human beings, ignorant and weak, are incapable of bringing ourselves up to the level of excellence to be able to maintain that excellence with any degree of consistency without continually falling. The grace of Christ, the life that Christ bestows upon us, is the very means by which the weaknesses within ourselves are overcome and we are actually freed up to live in a manner that is appropriate to our dignity as men and women created in God's image and likeness. So that, in the Christian theological view, the goal of life is to know God above all things and everything else in relationship to God. Under the principle that grace perfects nature, where the Greeks say our reason properly oriented to the divine ground allows us to judge rightly the things of this world, well now through the incarnation, we see clearly who that divine ground is. <coughs> We understand fully that it's the divine ground itself that works within our minds and hearts and lifts us up to, uh, to live in communion and union with him so that we might know as friends what he intends for our lives, the meaning and purpose of our lives, and the meaning and purpose of the things in the world which we encounter every day. To live in this fashion then, through the grace of Christ, um, freely choosing in faith, right, to live in um, a proper relationship with God, then is not only to become wise, but to become holy. And wisdom is good, but holiness is better, right? Because holiness itself is something that is bestowed upon us as a great gift by God, and it's um, something that's super added to our natural capacities as, as, as human beings 
with respect to our reason. Now, this is the great, this, um, this insight is really the, um, uh, the accomplishment of the medieval synthesis. Now don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I do not think that we can go back to the Middle Ages and recreate the Middle Ages. I have no desire to do that. I don't think it is worthy of even attempting to do that. But what I am saying is that the accomplishment of the medieval thinkers, Thomas Aquinas, Bonaventure, and so on and so forth, in their wrestling with these things, they have provided us with a clarity of insight into the nature of our humanity that we cannot forget, and yet, that our society has indeed forgotten. When we live in proper attunement to God, then we can see the things of this world with a clarity that we could not see before. Those things of this world that we see in relationship to God then become helps for us, not only in easing our life here on earth, but even more importantly, of helping us to achieve eternal life with God beyond this life. Without that insight, without that capacity to see and judge clearly the things of this world in light of the things of heaven, then in reality we would find ourselves imprisoned in the world, stuck in the mud, so to speak, incapable of rising above our condition and achieving um, a, a, a fuller perfection to which we are called. Now, understand something. If I live in attunement to the divine ground, and I especially, uh, and especially this is possible through the grace of Christ, then when I turn away from the divine ground and focus on something else, I become disordered. Disordered in what sense? Disordered in the sense of idolatry, that sense. Now idolatry, and I know I see some of my former students in here, so I'm going to remind them what idolatry is. Idolatry is the pursuit of that which is not God as if it was. And when we pursue that which is not God as if it was God, then we seek to establish our lives on a different foundation than what God intended for us to be. And when that happens, we, we become disordered more so in our minds, but also in our wills. Does everybody understand this? But there's a further problem because it's not simply that I become disordered in my mind and in my will by turning away from God and focusing on creatures. Christian tradition already teaches that there's an ontological wound that we all bear, which we call original sin. That we, from the time that we are born, are already disordered. We are, need of be we are in need, desperate need, of being reordered and rightly ordered. So that when I turn from God, and I focus on creatures as if it was God, it's not that I make myself disordered, I simply increase the disorder that I already experience within my own life. Does this make sense? Okay, now, now in both of these instances, right, both the classical Greek world and the Christian medieval world, you have to understand something. When the disorder in the individual soul reaches a critical mass, then disorder reigns within society in such a way that neither the wise king, the philosopher king, is capable of restoring order, the failure of Plato and Aristotle's experiment, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And what happens then is tyranny not wise rulership, but tyranny takes the place of proper order. And in this sense, what I mean by tyranny, although we could take the classical, sense, the, the, the classical definition of the tyrant actually imposing right, his, um, uh, his wants and desires on 
the society. But I'm thinking of tyranny in the sense that the disordered soul of the tyrant becomes the rule of law in which his disorder is imposed on society as if it was order. Not only do we have chaos, in other words, in this particular regard, but we also have confusion. What, was, what is good becomes evil, and what is evil becomes good, and there's really no way to adjudicate between, uh, between the two. And that's the um, situation I think that we find ourselves in today. Jay Budashevsky. How many of you have heard of Jay Budashevsky? He, he's a very fine author, and he, he even made a comment about this in his book, A Line Through the Heart, when he says that we have reached such a, um, such a state of disorder in our society that we can no longer philosophize about what right order is. We can only philosophize about the disorder within it. That's where we are. That's where we are. Now think about this. If the individual soul is disordered, and individuals make up the social order, then individuals who are disordered are going to give birth to a social order that is also disordered, right? Now, the source of our disorder today, in which there's an actual historical point in which we move from an understanding of being ordered to the divine ground, or being ordered towards God rightly, begins in the Renaissance with Petrarch in the 15th, 14th century. What happens with the Renaissance and subsequently with the scientific revolution? God is replaced, the meaning and purpose of life is revisioned, it's redefined to move away from God and in the place of God, the human being, man himself, is made the end and goal of the order of things. This is the purpose of the Renaissance, and subsequently it becomes the purpose of the scientific revolution, in which science is endowed with the same kind of powers that, um, that God himself is endowed with. In that historical moment, in that 14th century, there's a, no matter how bad the Middle Ages were, because people still sin then, don't get me wrong, it wasn't a, a utopia by any means, but the thing is that the medievals were wise enough to know that the organizing force within the world and society was God and not man. But in the Renaissance that changes. Man turns away from God and sets himself as the center of meaning and purpose. And so really over the course of the last 600 years, Western civilization has been collapsing precisely because the foundation for order in society is an idol, is the human being, the flawed, sinful, ontologically wounded human being. Now, I don't know about you, but over the course of the past 15 years, it seems to me that the collapse of the society in which we live has been accelerated. Why is that? It seems to me that Western civilization, at least since the 15th century, has been living on a borrowed worldview, the borrowed worldview of Christianity. And to the degree that that uh, borrowed worldview is becoming less and less um, uh, effective within the social order, is to the degree that the decay within our society becomes evident and especially at an increased rate. <coughs> Think about it. The HHS mandate in which um, it's presupposed in our Constitution that we have religious liberty, there's no more religious liberty. You cannot, you will not, right, so far as it's been determined, we will not be allowed to exercise our religion freely. Why is that? Because the political religions, this is Vogelin's and other people's term, the political religions cannot brook the competition from faith. There is not enough room for mammon 
and God sitting on the same throne. One of those is going to have to give way, and it looks like it for the moment, mammon has the upper hand. Does everybody understand this? Okay. So then, the Renaissance begins the, um, the beginning of the end of Western civilization. 600 years it's taken to the point to get where we are today. <laughs> And the reason we are where we are today is because we think that the disordered human being is natural, is good, and is capable of, redefin of defining life, its meaning, its purpose, and so on and so forth from its own skewed vision. We even have that, um, Joe, was it 1992, Casey? Yeah, what was the name of that? That's the, uh, the mystery of life clause. The sweet mystery of life. Yeah, the, the mystery of life clause. The, the Supreme Court says that people are free to define existence as they see fit, among other things. I always wonder if the Supreme Court realizes that it just put itself out of a job. Because how can it really tell me that I can define life as, as I see fit and then um, think that I ought to be subject to its authority. This is simply nonsense. The only way that um, eventually such things are going to be resolved is by an exercise of the will to power in which people are going to have to um, you know, restrain me, put me in jail, whatever the case may be, in order to resolve the issue. Reason has been lost. Freedom is lost. Even though we think that, we live in a world of increased freedom in consequence of this. Now, when, we, when our civilization d does this, when it replaces God with disordered man, we have the beginning of what Vogelin calls an egophonic revolt. I love that. Okay, just think ego for a minute, and then uh, epiphany without the epi. Right? When you have an egophony, then you have this appearance of the ego that becomes so large that it blocks out virtually everything else. This egophonic revolt is like the satanic revolt, the demonic revolt of Lucifer, who said when he was offered the opportunity to um, uh, be the greatest angel of God's heavenly host, who said he will not serve. And when human beings are placed as the center, the governing center of the universe, the meaning and purpose of life, they are essentially saying that they will not serve anything other than themselves and their own whims and desires. What's interesting and what takes place when this occurs is this. When God manifests himself and invites me through grace to participate in the divine life, he does not destroy my freedom, but actually frees up my freedom to say yes to him. And when I freely say yes to his offer of grace, I become subject to his rule. But when I reject God, when I reject God, with the mistaken notion that I become free because I'm no longer subject to the divine rule through my free choice, what happens is that I become subjected to a lower law. And the lower law that I become subjected to is my own desire. The medievals called it the fomes. Those of you who read Thomas Aquinas know that there's this word that's never translated into English from the Latin called the fomes. These are our concupiscential drives right, that keep us desiring and grasping for ultimately things that do not matter. And though that, those fomes then become the principle by which we live our life from that point forward. Not in the dignity of children of God, made in the image and likeness of God, but rather, in turning away from God, we essentially reduce ourselves to the level of animals because we live simply according to those 
um, drives and desires. And this seems to me to be where we are at the moment. And I would like to illustrate that by talking about the nature of love. I want to talk about how Christianity understands love, and rightly so. And I want to talk how our contemporary culture understands love with respect to our being subjected to these lesser laws. Now Christianity defines love as this. It is the willing of the good of the other for his or her own sake. I want us to think about this for a few minutes because we live in such a, um, a, such a world that thinks that, that love is really about desire, it's about feelings, it's about romance, and so on and so forth. But Christianity, while it um, appreciates those particular dimensions of um, love, recognizes that love is a matter of choice. It's a matter of an exercise of freedom in which I do not seek my own good, but I seek the good of my beloved. And to seek the good of my beloved, I, can't, I must do so on, and I'm going to use my wife as an example, I must do so on the level of her total humanity. Her physical self, her emotional self, her intellectual self, and her spiritual self. So for me to love my wife, I must love her in all re in respects to the entirety of her humanity, and I must choose her good in such a way that it promotes not only the health of these things, but ultimately her supernatural health with respect to her final end in God. To will the good of another person is to will their appropriate and proper end, their goal. And since nothing in this life is adequate to satisfying our humanity, then ultimately our choices through love must be geared in such a way as to aid our beloved to achieving everlasting beatitude with God. Now, that sounds like the way of the cross, does it not? If I'm willing the good of the other for his or her own sake and not simply because of my satisfaction, then in a certain sense, my willing the good of the other is an act of self-denial. I mean, it looks like that, right? It is that. But it's not an asceticism that, um, that destroys, right? It's kind of like an asceticism in which I lose myself in order to find myself. We'll come back to that here momentarily. So this is the dynamic that's going on, but there's something else that needs to be understood here. When we say that love is willing the good of the other for his or her own sake, we have to know what the good is. Now in Christianity, everything that God creates is good. So when we, are, um, when we are born into this world, we find everything in it good and attractive. All you have to do is watch an infant. Even dirt goes into the mouth, <laughs> right? Everything is attractive. I want, I want, I want, we find it attractive. But while everything is good because it participates in God's good, the goodness of God's own creative act, not everything is good for us, and so we need wisdom to be able to discriminate what is truly good for us and that which is only apparently good for us. Does this make sense? Now, but that doesn't really uh, tell me what the good is, right? The good is what is desirable. That's how Christianity defines good. The good is what is desirable. Now, to say that the good is desirable means that um, we human beings are in relation with the good world in which we are attracted out of ourselves to things within the world. How many of you um, had um, candy over the, um, over the holidays in your stocking, right? Man, are those Hershey Kisses? Look, I'm being drawn out of myself in the very act of seeing and being drawn to those good things, you see? So, 
the goodness of the world, because they participate in God's own goodness, we find the world desirable. And that desirability is what draws us out of ourselves into participation with the larger community of the world and not simply a fascination with our own navels and what's going on with inside us. Does this make sense, right? This is important. And the reason it's important is because the good draws us out of ourselves and by it we overcome our, our tendency to isolation, alienation, and love is the means by which we become involved, not only in the world in which we live, but also with others. Moreover, in knowing the good things of the world, I come to know who I am. I can't stay isolated from things and pretend that I know myself. So God gives us these good things to draw us into a participation not only in the life of this world, but in his life. It requires a response on my part. And in responding, in going out of myself, I become more of myself. I fall in love. Now interestingly, especially when we talk about the love of marriage, when I go out of myself in love towards the other, <coughs> myself is enriched and returned to me as a gift through the love of the beloved. So that when I will the good of my beloved for her own sake, I am not really giving anything up. What I am receiving, however, is a gift from my beloved in such a way that I become infinitely enriched by that. My wife, for example, um, compliments me in ways that I cannot even begin to enumerate here. I would take up the rest of the time. But I am richer because of that, not less so. In my willing her good on all of these levels, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, she receives that gift in gratitude and then in loving response returns those gifts to me in, an, in a way that are infinitely richer in many ways than what I've get, given to her. And in this mutual exchange, if you will, in this mutual loving, as Humani Vitae points out, we achieve, both of us achieve, our perfection in God and in every other aspect of our life, which is not excluded, by the way. You, know, you just don't have the spiritual life and then the physical life. They go hand in glove with one another. Does this make sense? Okay. Now, Christianity's understanding of love as the willing, the good, or the other then requires discipline. It requires training. I always tell my students when I teach the marriage class, if uh, I was married at 20, my wife was 19, we've been married almost 34 years, it's too long. <laughs> I always tell my students that if I love my wife the same as I do the same at 54 that I did when I was 20, there's no way that the love that that love would have survived. It's only in the course of loving over the years that I become uh, less selfish, not perfectly selfless. I've got a long way to go, but I become less selfish. More, um, more capable of giving, more capable of sharing. I mean, there are all these things that that go on that were not uh, that were not present when we were first married. Even though when I was first married, I thought I'd achieved the epitome of love. Well, it only took a week for that particular <laughs> to pop. Okay. Now then, now if that's the case, then. In loving as willing the good of the other, what happens then is that the ego recedes 
what comes to the fore is the willingness to serve the other in such a way that he or she achieves her ultimate happiness, her final good. This is a dynamic that is completely opposite to our contemporary understanding of love. Since we mentioned Mary and the Holy Family, and since we um, uh, celebrated the feast day of Mary, the Mother of God, yesterday, just recall the scriptural readings in which Mary herself, when she's confronted with the angel's message, says this, let it be done to me according to your word. She didn't make con um, conditions. She didn't set the conditions under which she would accept the message and the gift from God. Her ego receded to the point in which she placed herself completely at the service of God, and in placing herself completely at the service of God, she achieves her ultimate happiness, her highest good, despite the fact that we know that she is going to suffer greatly as a result of the loss of her son. This is what love is. Now when you think about it within the contemporary context, love is not willing the good of the other. Love is not the desirable. Love is what I desire. Now I want you to pay attention to that because it's key. Christianity says the good is what is desirable and love is willing the good of the other. Our contemporary culture, because it exalts man in place of God, says this, the good is what I desire. Now when I say that then, I become the source and the origin of the good. So much so that what I, whatever I desire, ipso facto, becomes good. You see where I'm going with this? So when we talk about the contemporary situation of homosexuality in the world today, especially within the United States and the drive for um, uh, homosexuals having the right of union and so on and so forth, it's always um, a claim on love, right? It's always a claim about love, and it's always a claim about, well, this is what I desire. How did we get here? How did we get to this point? in which the good is defined by my desire. And if I'm deprived of my desire, then I'm deprived of my good, and therefore deprived of my rights. Well, most proximately, you know, we've already talked about um, the Renaissance, that beginning there. Let's talk about the 60s and the sexual revolution. In the 60s and the sexual revolution, you have this ideal of love, that love is equivalent to sex. And when love is equivalent to sex, you're not very far from understanding that love is the same as desire. And when you live in a world in which love is equivalent to desire, then it, is a it becomes a necessity that desire becomes satisfied. Right? So in the 1960s sexual revolution, of which the homosexual movement today is an extension of that, it's simply an extension of that, we have what we might call the ultimate in, um, uh, the ultimate of love as being a consumer item. If you can't be with the one you love, says Crosby, still Nash and Young, then love the one you're with. And if you have a desire for someone of the same sex, and the desire defines what is good, and that desire is love, then love the one you're with. Now, when we say, as a society, that love is what we desire, then anything, any possible union becomes, um, I say, I should put it this way, any type of union becomes a possibility. There, there is no way to stop or draw the line. Well, it's not just between two women and two men. 
what, what draw, if I desire uh, poodles, what stops me from engaging in bestiality, for example? If I desire prepubescent children, what prohibits me from satisfying that desire? You see where the danger is? That once we define love merely as desire, and whatever I desire is good, then everything is permitted. We've entered into Dostoevsky's atheist utopia. This is scary. And it's scary precisely because of this. Do you know that over the course of the last two years, um, studies have been floated, although quietly, right, um, that, um, that pedophilia is an orientation? Right? And what does that mean? Well, homosexuality is an orientation as well. Well, if pedophilia is an orientation, then are we going to slowly begin as a society to remove the stigma <coughs> from that kind of um, sexual act, you can bet that we are. We're already well on the road to doing that. We're on the road to that with regard to um, polygamous marriages. Because we've got no way, there's no way anymore that we can draw a line. Because we have established that the rule of love is desire. And also that's the rule of the good. There is no higher appeal to authority because I am my own authority. Now, how many of you are teachers in here? How many of you are teachers in here? Okay, so you, you already see this amongst your students. And I especially see it amongst my college-age students who believe that simply because they want answers the question of value. It answers the question of virtue. It answers the question of what is true and good and beautiful. We are in serious, serious trouble. And I don't see it getting any better. Because Christianity, the lone voice of sanity in the world, is being increasingly pushed out of the public sphere. Cowed into silence. And so, in a real sense, to the degree that Christianity gives up the field in the culture wars is the degree to which we will be increasingly silenced and we will be increasingly mocked and we will be increasingly disdained until the forces of insanity win. It's that simple. Now, I, I was listening to a speaker um, back in um, September and also back in March I can't remember her name. This is awful. She wrote that book on um, uh, the abortion wars. Do you remember her name, Paul? Monica Miller. Yeah, Monica Miller, right? And she says this. The problem with Christians in today's world, and she was talking within the, um, the context of um, abortion, is that we're too nice. In other words, you know, we're, 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 too, we're too courteous, we don't want to make waves, we don't want to cause a scene, even when there are lives at stake. Especially in abortion wars. Well, guess what? In the culture wars with respect to marriage and its redefinition, there are lives at stake. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Just a couple months ago, there are two lesbians out in California who are married and they have a ten-year-old son. This 10-year-old son, they decided, really wants to be a girl. So um, at 10 years old, they've, um, they've started um, giving this young, uh, young child hormonal treatments in order to prohibit his um, uh, body from producing testosterone that would eventually lead him to becoming a male. Now, in any other context, we would call that child abuse, would we not? But no, we, we can't even say that anymore, right? Our contemporary society can't say that. And by my saying it, I have shown myself to be judgmental, intolerant, insensitive to the needs of others, and so on and so forth. But the fact of the matter is this, is that if love is what we desire, and what we desire is good, then we can impose our desires on others 
simply by an act of a will to power. What would traditionally be known as a form of abuse, a form of tyranny, becomes the order of the day. We have serious problems. Now the other thing that I want to draw your attention to is the fact that in the culture wars and in the propaganda pieces about um, uh, the puff pieces about homosexuality is that homosexuals are often portrayed as um, as normal as can be, right? They dress nice, they look like Republicans, for example, I mean, uh, you know, what, whatever the case may be. Rarely do you see images, for example, from San Francisco's gay rights parade and so on and so forth, which would actually um, turn people off if they saw the kind of stuff that would that is manifested during those during those types of parades. So there is a sense, at least given in the images, that homosexuality is really just as normal as heterosexuality. That's the image that we get. And we even get that through um, spokesmen like Dan Savage. How many of you know who Sa Dan Savage is, right? So Dan Savage, he writes articles called Savage Love, in which he's kind of like the, um, he's the vanguard of, of um, spokes, uh, a spokesman for the homosexual movement. But what we don't hear about are the sexual practices of homosexuality that are damaging to the body. We don't hear about those things because the, the superficial image that we're given is, um, is such that we, um, we assume that the, the sexual practice of, homosexu of homosexuals is really no different than the practices of heterosexuals. So we're deceived. If all we get is our understanding of homosexuality from the popular media and the popular press, then we're deceived. How many of you have heard that homosexuals um, are just as faithful to one another as heterosexuals are? How many of you have heard that? Right? And that, um, and that uh, things like infidelity are uh, really no problem. The divorce rate would be um, would not nearly be as much as that of, uh, of even heterosexuals. We've heard all these things, but those things aren't true. Even Dan Savage says that when he and his um, partner married, that for them, monogamy was not a big thing for them. That they do engage in sex with people outside of this so-called um, exclusive union. He's even coined a new, a new term for it. He calls it, we're, we're monogamish. Well, what does monogamish mean? Well, monogamish, if I told my wife, I said, I'm monogamish. <laughs> Why? Because the expectation is, is that in marriage, right, we enter into a, a faithful and exclusive relationship with, with another person of the opposite sex, the complementary sex. We don't enter into a, a relationship with multiple partners. Why? Because we can only give ourselves well to one person. And trust me, giving ourselves well to one person is enough work in a lifetime. <laughs> Does this make sense? Yes. Right? This, this, is why, this is why polygamy and other forms of sexual arrangements have been, um, have been um, uh, condemned as immoral, not only by the church, but by sane people like Aristotle and Plato. Why? Because it's contrary to reason. Such things are contrary to reason. But ladies and gentlemen, we don't live in a reasonable time. We live in a time in which we've abandoned reason. We have abandoned our nature as human beings. We simply live on the level of desire, of consumerism, if you will. Not only in respect to material goods, but with regard to sexual goods. And to say sexual goods means personal goods. We live on the level of consumerism with regard to persons.
And I think that is just sad and it's horrific. And the type of um, the type of harm that is going to be done in the contemporary name of love is going to be unimaginable. Is going to be unimaginable. And the whole time, the Catholic Church especially, Christianity um, in general, is mocked and disdained, but it's only Christianity that appropriately preserves and promotes reason in its truest sense. It's the Catholic Church specifically that promotes the dignity of the human being as both rational and free. Why? Because we understand that to be human is to be oriented fully to God in a relationship with grace, of, of a graced relationship by which we live and achieve the perfection of our own being. That's what it means to be a human being. When we live according to our desires, unchecked by, um, uh, by God or reason, then we live the life of the animal. We, we show no respect for people. We become consumers of persons. And ultimately, not only do we harm those others in the name of love, but we're convinced that in satisfying our own desires, we have satisfied the dictates of love. And all we've done is we've retreated into ourselves in such a way that we cannot relate to those outside of us, to the world in which we live, and we cannot certainly know who it is that we are. What time have I got, Mark? Perfect. Perfect? Yeah, I'm done. <laughs>